car is always dangerous. The winter is coming. I'm getting lost in the details of nothing. Remember the first time you saw Star Wars? We were still living at your mom's house. The Turtles meet April O'Neil for the first time. Splinter explains the origin of himself and the Turtles. This is Season 1, Episode 1 of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtle Tracks, and you are channel surfing with the bargain bin. Description from IMDb, we will not be holding back on spoilers. I am Sandro, and I am joined, as always, by my podcast partner in crime, Ben, and the Newfoundland nightmare, Justin Newha. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> what did we think? I can't remember the last time I watched this, so it was perfectly nostalgic. Is the best way to put it. I definitely watched this last when I was a preteen. Mm -hmm. Again, yes, the nostalgia factor was insane. As soon as that theme song hits, I'm like fist pumping and ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a very specific reason for picking this show as well as our guest for this season because Justin and I got into some very heated discussions about the new movie which I will not revisit here. But through that, I saw that we had a common interest in the property of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So before I get into my story, what's your guys' background with this show? Like I said, I haven't watched it since I was a child. So the, the, remembering everything wasn't there, but as soon as it started, it reminded me of the opening of the movie as well. Like the first Ninja Turtles movie. They did a really good job of like, making it feel like if I watched the movie after these TV shows, I think these cartoon shows, I'd be like, Oh, that's where they drew their inspiration from was from this clearly. Fair. I, <laughs> Sandra, you're going to hate me. You're going to hate me so much for this. Okay. I absolutely loved this show when I was a kid. Loved it. Like I, my dad, I got my dad to set the VCR so it would record because I wouldn't get home from school in time to watch it. And I would just rewatch the episode from that day over and over and over and over. And I loved it. And I watched the, uh, the first episode, which we'll talk about tonight. And uh, after I watched it, I couldn't even remember what I watched. <laughs> it just... It felt so light and fluffy. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, um, well, obviously, it's uh, I'm a fucking 40-year-old man watching a, a cartoon from... W what year was this? 1987. Yeah, exactly. So I first watched this when I was five. However, that, that theme song will stick with me until the day I die. Forever. <laughs> Tell us your, your introduction to Ninja Turtles and why this means so much to you. So I moved to Canada when I was four years old. We've talked about that in detail. I had started to learn Croatian as my first language. So I was a little bit behind everybody else when I got here. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years after that, I was at the age that this would have hit and it would have been really popular. And this was kind of the first big show that I really grasped and understood most of what was going on. And it was clearly a show intended for children. So it was something that really helped me kind of anchor myself in this new country. The, the show came from the comic book, which clearly had a much darker tone. And this was the attempt to bring it to like a wide scale audience and to make it a lot like a lot more lighthearted for children. And it worked. Ninja Turtles is still popular to this day. They've had multiple iterations of TV shows, multiple series of movies. And it, none of that would have happened without this show. This was the starting point. So mm -hmm. obviously, I just absolutely loved it. And to get into the episode, there's no better way to start than this wicked theme song. <laughs> <laughs> it is probably one of the best cartoon theme songs of all time. Yeah, I could agree with that. And there's some good ones out there. So it's just it's so fucking upbeat, man. I hear it, and I'm like, yeah, it's pretty fun. And halfway through, I'm already, like, fist pumping in the air. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a grown man. Like, I shouldn't be doing this. But it, it gets me so jazzed up. I'm so excited for it. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, oh, I haven't watched this in so long. And I'm so excited to cover the entire first season with you two. 
And that's that's the curious thing, right? We watched this show when we were kids. How many people really recalled that the first season was a five episode pilot? I didn't understand seasons at the time. One thing I do understand is the longevity of the fandom. Because at the record store where I work, we sell toys based off of the animated series. And the amount of people that come in and they're like, I need this, I need this, I need that. It's all from the first two, three seasons of the show. We get orders online. I'm shipping stuff all over the world. All over the world. And they're like, I, I really need Mondo Gecko. I'm like, I don't <laughs> think you do, but I will definitely take your money and send this to you. I actually bought the entire series on DVD before my collection was stolen. Yeah. And I guess to kind of give it a little bit more content, when you buy season one, it gives you the five episodes, but then it gives you four episodes from season 10, just so that you have a little bit more substance, because it is only five episodes. Yeah, there is a, there was a guy that came in the store the other day. He's like, I need that. I'm like, what do you mean that? He's like, Attack of the Killer Pizzas. I'm like, well, that's, that, it's not what it's called, but... Oh, that, that is what that, the episode that character is from. Uh, you just assume that I know what you're talking about because you're so <laughs> you're so ingrained in the culture of the TMNT cartoon that you expect everyone knows what you're talking about. And luckily enough, I was and I did. But it's it's so nice to see that in 2023, this show is still resonating with people. God. I, I, I feel bad. I, I fell off of the show before it was over. Sandra, how many seasons did this run? Ten. Ten. I, I fell off maybe at five? You would remember if you watched it pretty far. Justin, do you know how far you watched it? I can't say I do, because I was born the year that this started. <laughs> oh, you oh, young. And yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot, man. <laughs> so when I don't think I got introduced to it until around 92 93 okay so by that point a few seasons were already out and then of course just growing up when you watch it on tv you don't i wasn't like uh, like ben said i wasn't aware of what seasons were or anything like that i just knew that it was coming on so i don't remember where i've left off or if i even completed the whole thing because yeah it just feels like a fever dream when you're back that young you don't remember what anything is so if you actually stuck with the show and i also didn't know what seasons were either i mean i was watching it at a point where it was on like five days a week after school and syndication i had no idea what seasons i was watching yeah what the overarching storylines were but by season seven seven or eight it had changed drastically to the point that like it didn't even have this theme song it mm -hmm. was splicing in movie uh clips from the live action into the intro Really? The sky was permanently red in New York City. The art style had changed. Shredder was no longer the villain. There was a villain that was actually an alien named Lord Dreg, who was voiced by the amazing Tony J. So if, if you're familiar with Tony J, he's been a voice actor for like ever. He even did the voice of the Elder God in one of my favorite video game series, uh, Soul Reaver. It is very, very different. They felt, it felt like they were trying to kind of grow the show with their audience and kind of get a little bit more into a darker side. There was some like some human Weird. character named Carter who could turn into a mutant on command. What? So it, it, it is stuff that I definitely didn't watch during that run. So I must have fallen off before that. Yeah, it's a little much. So anyway, this episode serves as an origin episode, which I mean, we've seen multiple iterations of the origin through the comic books, the movies. This is probably the one that most people are familiar with. We get crimes taking over the city. You see thugs, which are clearly, if you know the show, future Rocksteady and Bebop are involved in that. Yeah. Actually, I want to ask you guys about the art style here. Some humans are made to look normal, and then others have very characterized proportions to different features. Did any of this, like, seem jarring to you? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think you're gonna hate this. 
The, uh, this show is, is super fucking racist. Oh, it's so racist. <laughs> it's it's really bad. Really, really bad. I did not realize until revisiting this recently. Um, yeah, they um, they took creative liberties. I will leave it at that. <laughs> One of the cost-cutting things that they did was have multiple people reprising different voices. So you, if you if you know, you'll find them all around. But we get to a scene after April has like this news report where there's a scientific investigator. These marks could have only been done by a samurai sword. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> this is clearly ninja rope. <laughs> yeah, because it's because how do you know? Because it says it's made in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no way that that would work in a cartoon these days. None, none of this. The samurai sword thing wouldn't be as bad if it was like a knife expert was on scene and was like, "Oh, this is how." this would make an incision or something. It's like, okay, well, if it's like a knife expert, he knows that it's from... But the whole rope thing, it's like, well, how... <laughs> what? You could wing it in a way that there'd be an expert. You know, what was that show? With, or not Ultimate Warriors, but the... No, Deadliest Warrior, where, like, the guys would break down and, like, use all these different weapons and stuff. So, of course, there's experts out there. But just to have some random old white dude walk up, like, yeah, samurai sword. <laughs> All right, I guess we're moving on to the next point, right? <laughs> oh, it, it, it gets worse. But we do get kind of like the origin here that everybody's familiar with, although it changes a little bit, with April essentially being put in danger and then the turtles being the ones to save her. It reminded me so much of the movie. So much of the movie. All right. I have to say a couple of things here. Okay. When they charge her, she runs away, and she just dives into the street randomly and just slides to a stop. There's no one behind her in the shot, so she just throws herself on the ground and then decides to shuffle herself down a sewer drain into the sewer. It's the most likely escape method. <laughs> <laughs> but... The gang eventually catches up, and there's a wide shot, or a wide drawing, sorry. And some of the gang members are trying to lift up the sidewalk <laughs> to get down to her. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> what are we doing here, guys? Science. <laughs> it's so bad. And, like, and Bebop is leading the crew, which, I mean, I'm cool with. I, I've always liked Bebop more than Rocksteady. But yeah, now we we end up, like you said, Sandra, April's in the sewers. Somehow just runs into a wall. <laughs> it's directly in front of her, and she's just looking back, face first into it, almost knocks herself out, and then we get the turtle reveal. Kind of. Yeah, the silhouette. Well, it's our first bit of action. So what did you think of the way that they animated the actual fight scenes in this now that we finally get one? It was, they did a really good job of making a silhouette thing like where obviously if you know anything about the turtles, you know who they are right away. But it's, mm -hmm. it's done in a way that animation style, especially done in the late 80s, it's like, okay, that's actually well done. Yeah, it's probably some of the best 80s animation I've ever seen. I think that's another thing that would easily rope people in. Mm -hmm. It's borderline rotoscope for me. I don't know if you guys know that type of... Uh, okay, so, yes. That actually makes a bit more sense because I've been watching a channel called Quarter Group Crew for years now on YouTube. And they're, okay. all, they're all digital artists, like CGI artists. Um, mm -hmm. they're, movie, they're movie makers. They're out of LA. They're amazing guys. Um, and every week they'll either have like a, a, a CGI expert or stunt man or somebody reacts and then they react to the stuff that they do in their field. So okay. I learned, I learned what rotoscoping was a couple of years ago. I was like, now I'll watch movies. And like me and Emily watch them. We, we and Emily every, every winter time we'll watch uh, Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And every time we watch the first movie, I'm like leaning over. I'm like, that's fucking shitty CGI. I like that. <laughs> 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 and of course it is for its time or whatever but 
yeah, sorry to run out of tangent, but if you guys ever have a chance, check out Quarter Digital or Quarter Crew. And they're just, they're really fucking good at what they do. Oh, definitely, man. And I, I think it's, it, the show kind of stands out because the animation for this year, it's pretty fucking good. Yeah. I mean, you look back now, it's kind of janky. Like, especially where April's starting to learn the, the turtle story. But, um, I don't understand why the turtles in this version just walk out of the shadows. <laughs> like, why they just trying... reveal themselves? Yeah. Like, if, if, in most of the origin stories, they kind of get caught saving mm-hmm. April. In this, they're just like, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there are certain things about this show that, they don't they don't play well to a, an older audience it's like when splinter is telling the uh the origin story of himself and like the whole orokusaki thing and it just cuts to him reading a book and the title on the book just says art <laughs> you're like all right yeah i mean like it, it, this is obviously for children but <laughs> come on guys I totally forgot that he was a human too, like in this series, like he can't came in contact with the ooze type thing. Uh, dude, and we want to talk racist caricatures. Ugh. Oh, you're gonna get into the scene Holy with the dojo, aren't you? Holy <laughs> shit, the dojo <laughs> is fucking crazy. <laughs> you can't do that today. You just can't. <laughs> can't in the sense of what? So can't in the sense of what? Do it animation style or because like they were they were guys that were oh. from Japan and like, they definitely weren't voiced by people from Japan. So yes, it's definitely the animation style. Like the, the sensei at the dojo, <laughs> his eyes look like okay, two yes. giant yeah. potatoes <laughs> sideways. Like we, we can't do this anymore. Like these, these are definitely racist caricatures. Yeah. However, I want to talk about the uh, the origin of the mutation of the turtles. Okay. So, covered in the mutagen, which is pink in the show and yeah. green in the movies. That's fine. They would evolve into a mixture of themselves and whatever the last living organism that they we're in contact yeah, with, right? Yeah, yeah. So they become humanoid. Splinter becomes a rat man, even though, even though he just as a human, go. yeah, the last things he touched were turtles. <laughs> okay, but I need to go back and watch this very quick. Did he not have a cloth? Uh, he wiped them off with a cloth, but yeah. he's cradling them with his other arm. Okay. Although, if you guys are getting into the science of this, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is not why you watch this. Well, we want some seriousness of it. No, no. Okay, we we can't talk about seriousness when we talk about like a guy being confronted by the Foot Clan and he throws his hands up in the air and an ice cream cone lands on his head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And they're all talking in perfect English. We get this origin, we get this reveal, then we get the very kid-friendly, here's each turtle and a little bit about their weapons so that you can learn their names and, and just kind of gravitate to it. And then April decides that they must be the thieves because they're ninjas. And yeah. even when one of the turtle asks, well, but were they, were the thieves turtles? She's like, that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we, we've got the intros. Uh, gentlemen, I have to ask now. It, it has to come up at some point. Favorite turtle? Raph. Raph. Don. Ooh. Why Donnie? Donnie's fucking great. I, they're all great. He's the smart one. He's got the bow staff. Uh, I mean, he's voiced by Corey Feldman in the movie. Yeah, I knew that was going to be it. <laughs> got to get one of the Corys in there, man. <laughs> I mean, if you had Corey Haim voice Leo, I would pick Leo as much as I hate him. Anyways. <laughs> Sorry. Wait, wait, hate Leo? 
I don't like Leo at all. Why? I find him really boring. He's the righteous leader. That's yeah. the character. You get that in so many shows. It's so boring, though. He's, he's, he's a brother that's trying to control us three other wild child. That's why I understand why you guys like Wrath. Why we like Wrath? Yeah, I, I think you guys like Wrath because he's the wild card, right? I'm a huge anti-hero person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you don't find Leo vanilla? I do, but that's who he needs to be to be able to, like, he needs to always be in like a, a, a more of a zen state to be able to control these three other wild childs, and he needs to be able to make the right decisions, so you can't do that if your characteristic is a party guy or an asshole or the smart one. I feel like I really pissed you off there, man. That pissed me off. Just, I needed to educate <laughs> you on why he was the way he was. <laughs> Un understood. Uh, let's break the tension by going to something a little more lighthearted. The running joke in the show, if you want to call it a joke, air quotes, of ridiculous pizza toppings. Because Mikey also breaks up this origin story and this accusation by bringing in pizza. And I yeah. actually did take note of which ones were introduced here. Okay. Pepperoni and ice cream. <laughs> Jelly beans and mushroom. An anchovy and peanut butter. I don't have anything more to say about that. I just wanted to point it out. <laughs> I would try the uh, pepperoni and ice cream. I would try the anchovy and peanut butter. <laughs> so after a little bit of a thinking, they decide that the only way that April's going to believe they're not the thieves is to go catch the real thieves so that she can get a new story out of it. And this leads to... What I have to imagine is the first time in this universe, them going up to the surface. Mm -hmm. And what do they disguise themselves in? Trench coats and fedoras. So good. It, it, once again, they, the, 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 the movie took that from that as well. You would never notice a giant green schnoz <laughs> just... Well, they try to reiterate that they can't, she can't tell who's who because... You know, she keeps on messing their names up. Yeah, I love that. That's a great gag that goes throughout the entire thing. Yeah. Um, when they go topside, though, it's all the signs that really kind of throw me off. Like, Ninja Dry Cleaner, Ninja Shoe Repair, Ninja Rental. None of it makes sense. Ninja Dentist. That's the one that got me. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then one of them goes, ow, after he says Ninja Dentist. But that's, yeah. the, that's, the, that's the hood they're in. And then they go to the Ninja Pizza Shop. And uh, it, the people working, like, I, 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 I don't know, guys. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it reminded me being in, like, an indie locker room. Just, like, a big, wide range of people, height, sizes. And, of course, everyone's just acting foolish, so... <laughs> Maybe this show is a little more inclusive than we thought because they're letting anybody be the ninjas. <laughs> well, the, guy, the guy working cash greets them and just drives a sword into the countertop and some guy in the background starts spinning up uh, the dough and wanders off while he's doing it. And in this pizza shop, in this pizza shop, because of course, this is the whole reason the turtles wanted to go up there. They're like, man, this place is weird. They don't have pepperoni. And then the waiter brings them a sashimi pizza and three whipped cream pizzas. Again, no comment on that. Just wanted to point it out. I have to ask why Shredder is watching the security cameras for this pizza shop. Well, because when the thugs reported back to him, he, yes. he thought that it might be like something to do with the turtles. I don't know how he knows any of this. So he's. Keep it, but like, how wide is Shredder's reach in this? I don't know. Yeah, it has to be he's super wide if he, if he uh, has cameras down in the sewer. Well, that was like drones or something like that, right? Like he was following them. And Does like, it say that? I think so. Because to me, it was just like, oh, he's just got like hookups to every camera in the city. And apparently there's cameras down in the sewer. I actually feel kind of bad we haven't mentioned this now, but like Shredder is voiced by... James Avery, rest in peace. Uncle Phil. R.I.P. Uncle Phil. And honestly, like, this is one of the most iconic voices in my childhood. 
I would say in cartoon history. Yeah. 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 He does have a little bit of a accent to himself, though, I will say. That, like, he could have just been, like, normal Uncle Phil and just talked, like, how he normally does. But if you go back and listen to it, he does have a little bit of, like... It's almost like a yeah. like a bit more of a grainy voice. Like, he's trying to be a little bit more raspy just to sound more evil. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But, like, when I'm talking about his reach, there's, like, a security place. And it's, it's I guess, how they're getting their targets for, for the high-tech stuff that they're stealing. Yeah. The only part that stood out to me is, like, there's a lady at the front counter who's, like, telling the foot soldiers, we got another one. It's like, she's clearly evil. Yeah. She, she never comes up again. She's clearly evil. But the way the foot soldiers walk up to that desk is one of the funniest fucking things I've seen in my entire goddamn life. It's like monkey arms, right? Oh, that's the perfect way. Perfect yeah. way to describe it. Yeah. I, I stopped and rewatched that maybe four times. Why? Because it's it was so funny. ridiculous. Just the, just the view of it, just the way, the angle, everything they chose about that particular drawing was, yeah. It's, it's that walk followed by April slowly backing out of the building, being like, uh, oh, this is real fucked up. Hold on, we just skipped over one of the bigger things that I was like, why did this happen? Old lady hauls out an AK? Oh, yeah. When they oh, first yeah. came out of the sewer, just a lady with a shopping cart just pulls out a machine gun on them. <laughs> like, I would have just I would have just went back down, down the sewer at that point. Was, uh, we'll do this what? another day. <laughs> I, I think the meaning behind that comedic moment was to just show how bad it's gotten in the state of the, the area. The meaning. <laughs> I mean, there's probably different ways to go about that, but okay. Okay, okay. So April gets kidnapped, of course, and somehow the turtles find her because they spot her purse just dangling off of the top of a very tall building pretty far away. Okay, yeah, I, I need to address that too. Outside of the, the phone booth, which she gets abducted from very easily. Oh, it's April's press pass. Oh, it's April's wallet. Oh, it's this chewed gum. I'd recognize it anywhere. Hey, look, there's her purse hanging from the top of a building. <laughs> they weren't detectives, Ben. <laughs> Nothing suspicious. It can't be a trap, though, right? They get to the top of the building, draw their weapons when they see the Foot Clan, and are very, very hesitant to fight. But wait... They're robots, guys. Now we can actually kill all of them brutally. Yeah, and I think that that is actually done strategically because there was a push for censorship back with cartoons like this. That's why yeah. if you go back and watch like Thundercats, they never actually hit anyone with their weapons. If, if, if you watch the episode, Sandro, they don't hit anybody with their weapons in this either. They just explode before the weapon makes it contact. Well, fine. <laughs> but I think that that was more for the sensors and the viewership to clarify that they're not actually harming people. Yes. Even though it's a cartoon, which somehow needed to be clarified. Yeah. But I, I feel like that whole reveal that they're robots and they're hesitant to fight them until that happens was done for that reason. Of course, yeah. If the, the Foot Clan weren't robots, we would not have had this show. It, it just wouldn't yeah. have been possible. No. Especially in 87. Yeah. This fight actually got me so pumped. As soon as they find out they're robots, and Raphael's like, clang. What? Michelangelo rips off his trench coat and does like the typical cartoon, like, all right, let's have a strobe effect as he's jumping into battle. And the fight music <laughs> kicks in. And I just got so pumped for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to back up my my claim uh, and belief that uh, Donnie is the best turtle, when they use the rope to escape the, the rooftop, he's the only one that uses anything other than his hands to slide down. He uses his staff to slide down the rope. Everyone else uses their bare fucking hand. Well. Uh, yes, Justin? You can't use a sword. Because you're going to cut the rope, a sigh would potentially cut the rope as well. And if you used if you use nunchucks, the metal could tear the rope as well. 
So not not if you hold the nunchucks stacked. Oh, no, yeah, if you hold, like if you hold them, right. yes, if you hold them stacked, then the wood on wood or plastic on wood would be fine. But as any human would know, a sharp metal object would tear or cut material. So yeah, but if you're gonna slide between the rooftops of two buildings with your bare hands on rope, your hands aren't making it. You're obsessing over this way too much, considering that the fight ended by them pushing a brick wall over. Yeah, because like, is it, yeah, human hands aren't going to be able to survive that. But do we know what turtle hands? Are <laughs> hey, hey, April was right behind them, doing the exact same thing. Uh, she had gloves on. <laughs> Justin's like, fuck off. <laughs> 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 we get the final sequence which is essentially them entering the building in order to exit the building because <laughs> it's being flooded but the part yeah. that i found hilarious about this is that shredder is like oh they're in the building i can't let them discover the technodrome and then goes on to the intercom and announces everyone to return to the technodrome so that they immediately know that that's a thing yeah and they're like the technodrome where's that yeah. And I guess the contingency plan is to flood and destroy the entire building. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, man. And this whole sequence lasts like 2 minutes and we're at the end. They they show Splinter the co- like the costume for the Foot Clan. That's enough for him to know that the Shredder is alive and around. And even though they really didn't do much of anything, April is now okay with them. And they end the show with her joining in the joke and asking for a slice of banana and sausage pizza. That's also another one I try. I do it. Yeah. Innuendo much? Oh, well, you took it there. Anyway, I don't have any comment about the pizza. Just well, wanted to mention it. Clearly you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's the first episode. So I'm going to ask you guys, was there a particular highlight that stood out for you? Um, I'm going to be cheap on this one, and I will not do it again. But for me, it was the theme song. <sighs> the fucking memories that it brought back. Insane. I didn't realize how much I loved it and how much I missed watching TMNT until I heard that theme song again. Yeah. Uh, the episode itself, honestly, I'm not overly keen on. But I know how many episodes of the show I have watched and loved. And hearing that theme song just, oh, it fucking destroyed me. So, yeah, my highlight, by far, the theme. Uh, I love, I'm not, I'm not agreeing, like, I'm not saying the theme song as well. I did love it. But it's like, you can ask Emily, when I pressed play to watch the episode, instantly my head started bobbing and my whole body started bouncing. I'm like, yes, <laughs> we're going on a journey, boys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I love the whole the vibe that it gave me. Like I said, the whole opening um, just really made me think of the first movie. Just like the tone, mm-hmm. the way the music was, the way it was like a, you know, she, it was really Raph that saved her the first time, like in the movie, but they had everybody do it in the, in the cartoon or whatever. But it just gave me that same vibe. And I was like, oh, like if we can contain this whole thing, the whole series, which I'm sure it's not going to happen. Uh, but it was just a great feeling. Uh, and I, I love breaking the fourth wall. So when Donnie, I can't remember, I can't remember exactly what he says right now, but he looks at the camera and goes, I've always wanted to say that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he tells April when she says she's going to join them to go on the investigation, he says, you wouldn't last five minutes up there. And then he looks at the camera and says, I've always wanted to say that. (laughs) Yeah. So anytime, anytime a show breaks the fourth wall, once that I'm always, I'm always about that. So, but no, it was just the whole vibe from the beginning it just made me feel like I was watching the the first movie. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to go in a completely different direction here, but there's a line in the show by April that just had me. I want to say laughing, but more just kind of turning it over in my mind many, many times. When she's running away from the assailants on the first attack before she dives into the sewer, she says, and I quote, This is great. I must be on to something big if they're trying to kill me. me. (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty fucked up. 
<laughs> yeah. They can mention that, but then they can't actually let foot soldiers die. Well, and that's the thing, right? Like, censorship was so weird in the 80s. Like, you could suggest that somebody is going to attempt to kill you, but you can't fight humans. But this character is gleeful about the fact that they're pursuing her because that must mean there's a big story to tell. As wow. long as she survives it. Journalistic integrity, man. <laughs> Gotta get the story. Yeah. All right, so there's only one episode, so we won't be doing a ranking this week. We'll start that next week. So until then, have a good one. All the best. <laughs> Later, guys. <laughs>